My name's Paul Cockshot. I am the co-author of the book Towards a New Socialism. I wrote it with my friend Alan Cottrell, and we wrote it in response to a political situation in the 1980s where the Soviet Union was obviously getting into difficulties. And within Britain, pro-market ideas were spreading in the Labour Party. Particularly influential at that time was the professor of Soviet studies at Glasgow University who wrote a book advocating market socialism. He was an expert in the Soviet economy, so his arguments seemed convincing, and they certainly convinced the leadership of the Labour Party in Britain. But we thought we could refute those using ideas from modern computer science and also from classical political economy. And that's what our, our book was about. We're in the 21st century and people are starting to think again of the viability of socialism and it seems to me that there are now a number of people coming together and saying that there are three key ingredients to a viable socialism today. One of them is the replacement of money and prices with value-based economics, with economics based on labour time. The other is the use of the very much more advanced information technology we now have to make rational and detailed planning of the economy feasible in a way it wasn't before. And finally, the principle I think most modern socialists would advocate is the replacement of representative democracy with some form of participatory democracy to give the majority of the people real control over the disposition of national income. Now, the question as to why socialism would be preferred to capitalism can't be answered in the abstract or in general because not everyone is going to prefer it. Uh, who's going to prefer it is going to depend on whether they're rich or poor, basically. And the studies we've done of the distribution of income in Britain indicate that if an egalitarian system of payment was introduced, the overwhelming majority of the population would benefit. We calculated in the early 90s how much a person would get if an egalitarian system of payment was introduced. And the only section of the population which would lose out was the top 25% of men in office jobs. All manual workers, male or female, would win out. All, you know, all quartiles of female workers would win out. And three quarters of male office workers would win out. And the, the people who'd lose out, obviously, are the, a small minority of the best paid people and an even smaller minority of people deriving their income from property. One of the th points that Nove brought out in his book was the inability of the Soviet planners to plan in detail. Now, you can take uh, examples, I think Dobb cited this as well. They, they could set a plan for the number of pairs of trousers they were going to make, but they didn't necessarily get the right plan for the number of zips they were going to have for the pairs of trousers. So that you, you end up with trousers without zips or shoes without laces. Now, that kind of thing came from the fact that the plan targets were set in aggregate terms. The plan targets would be set for maybe a thousand different or a couple of thousand different categories of goods and they were set in money terms. They weren't set in terms of the actual physical products that were going to be made. Now, you contrast that with the, the system of product codes, which is introdu was introduced in the capitalist world in the uh, 70s, the barcode system, that enables 
every single individual product have a unique identification number. And the modern supermarkets have a feedback system whereby they know exactly how many of every product is being sold. And you need a planning system that goes right down to the product code level if it's going to be efficient. I've done experiments with a modest computer costing maybe £5,000, which our department has, and found I could solve the equations for an economy roughly the size of the Swedish economy in about two minutes. Um, if one had used the types of economists, uh, sorry, types of computers which the physics department here have or any weather forecasting centre has, then it would be a very easy matter to solve the, the equations. The remaining problem is the, the problem of, of obtaining the information, collecting the statistics. And that also is becoming a lot easier because when you think of it, every production facility nowadays uses computers for ordering its components. It uses computerized spreadsheets for calculating its costs. The data is already being entered into computers and into databases. And in many cases, users and suppliers share these databases already in the capitalist world. At the same time, Companies like Google have developed the technology to, to send spiders across the web and concentrate enormous amounts of information in their servers. Were it the case that companies generated web pages containing the information about what they needed to produce each of their products, then that could easily be captured by uh, systems analogous to Google. And what stops it being done at the moment is obviously commercial secrecy. Companies don't want others to know what they're doing. But if we envisage a system of, of publicly owned enterprises, there's no reason why they shouldn't publish their, their resource requirements as web pages um, or by some appropriate submission system to a database and collect the data that's required for planning. The idea of using labour vouchers instead of money goes back a long way in socialist thought. The first person to propose it was Robert Owen, who proposed it in probably about the 1830s or so. And his idea was that you'd get rid of banknotes and people would be paid in labour notes. And if someone had worked, let's say, five hours during the day producing something, they would get labor notes denoted in in five hours and you could then go to a cooperative store and buy goods that had taken five hours to make. Now if you did that the, would, the, the middleman would have been cut out, there'd be no profit being made either by the shop or by the employer and therefore the main cause of exploitation would be got rid of in one stroke. Now the, the idea was adopted also in one form or another by La Salle, Proudhon and Marx. All the 19th century socialist leaders advocated it. Another difference between labour vouchers and money, however, is that money can circulate between people and that is the basis on which capitalist exploitation is based, employing people and then giving them back only half the value they produce. In order to prevent this, Owen's scheme was that these labour vouchers wouldn't circulate. They'd be cancelled out once people had handed them in to the cooperative store. They could only be used once. And therefore, you couldn't get a circulation of capital arising. Nowadays, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that with paper. You'd obviously use some kind of electronic accounting system similar to credit cards, but the same principle applies. One of the problems that socialists always encounter is people saying that if you reduce income differentials there'll be no incentives. Now if you take this in the case of labour vouchers, you have to realise what the labour vouchers are being given for. They're being given for people performing work of average intensity and where it's possible to measure physical productivity and that one person is physically turning out more 
goods in an hour than another person, then it's possible to pay one person more than another because you know they're physically producing more. When it comes to highly collective work, where a lot of people collaborate, then it's not so easy to say that one particular person has contributed more or less to that. And under those circumstances, you can't rely on that kind of incentive. But if you think that only monetary incentives are, are relevant, you have to explain two very important features of the modern world. One of them is the success of the Japanese economy, where people are not paid monetary incentives in companies, but they tend to be paid a salary which just depends on the number of years' service. And this doesn't stop Japan having the most productive workers in the world. Then you take another example and look at two people. You look at Bill Gates and you look at Linus Torvalds. And Bill Gates owns a company whose developers produce Windows, and Linus Torvalds wrote the original Linux operating system. Now, Linus Torvalds and the other developers of Linux do it from love of workmanship. They do it from love of producing something useful. And in the end, they've produced something more useful than the people with monetary incentives like Bill Gates. The, if you look at the internet now, it runs largely on Linux servers. It runs using Apache web servers. All of this is software that's been written by people just for the love of doing it. And one shouldn't underestimate the extent to which people have a pride in their work and want their work to be done well. And they're willing even to do this, as the free software movement shows. They're willing to do it without being paid at all if the satisfaction of the work is enough. If you had a system of people being paid by labour vouchers, the average person would get roughly twice as much as they get now, or twice the before-tax income they get now, because it's a general feature of most capitalist economies that income tends to divide roughly 50-50 between wages and profits. It's slightly lower level of, of uh, profits than that in Britain, but historically over time it's tended to be roughly 50-50. So that you'd see roughly a doubling of, of real incomes. People obviously have to pay taxes on top of that, but the pre-tax income would roughly double. Now the question is whether people who have had more education should be paid more. Now in a capitalist economy they get paid more if there is a shortage of that particular skill, particularly, for example, if you look at doctors in the United States, they're paid extremely highly because the American Medical Association acts to restrict the supply of doctors. If, on the other hand, you have in a capitalist economy a profession which requires education, but there's a lot of people being educated for it, like media studies, for example, a lot of people are being educated to do media studies at the moment. And the salaries that they get from that are not above what you'd get as an average manual worker. The reason is that, that supply and demand in that case. But more generally, if you take professions which are paid highly in the capitalist world, it tends to be the case that the education is expensive and only rich families can afford to send their children to get that education and therefore the supply is restricted. If the education is paid for by the state and people are paid a salary whilst they're students, then there is no particular reason why the individual should benefit from that. The costs of education haven't been met by the individual, they've been met by the taxpayer. And if the restriction on entry due to, to lack of wealth is removed, one would expect to see the shortage of supply removed as well. If one compares the situation of doctors in the United States with doctors in the Soviet Union, doctors in the United States were relatively scarce and highly paid. Doctors in the Soviet Union or Cuba are plentiful and not particularly highly paid. But it doesn't stop people wanting to become doctors because many people want to become doctors for humanitarian reasons.
One of the key differences between a socialist economy and a capitalist economy is that in a capitalist economy there's always unemployment. And this unemployment acts as a stick to beat the worker to work harder. Now, in a socialist economy where the allocation of resources is being planned, you tend to get full employment. You, get, you had full employment in all the socialist economies when they existed. However, full employment could come in two forms. It could either come because in the economy as a whole there was sufficient demand for labour to take up all the people willing to work. Or it could come because people had a right to work at one particular workplace where they started work. Now if you have the latter form you run the danger that the economy will become set in concrete. It becomes very difficult to reallocate resources to new industries and to run down old industries as tastes change or technologies change. So it has to be the case that, pe that the state guarantees people a job but doesn't necessarily guarantee them a job at the same place indefinitely. That if factories are being closed down, the state must guarantee to create an equal number of jobs elsewhere in the economy before they close those factories down so that people can transfer. But it doesn't mean that you keep on running the same factories as you ran in, in the year 2000 until the year 2050. Originally, democracy meant rule by the mass of the people. Especially, Aristotle makes this clear, it means rule by the poorer mass of the people. The system we have now is called democracy, but is actually a system of electoral rule, which, according to ancient Greek political theory at least, would be better described as an aristocracy or meritocracy than a democracy, because any system based on elections is based on a principle of selecting people who appear to be the best to rule. And who appears to be the best in any society? It, it, the people who appear to be the best are always the richer and better educated. Uh, Aristotle says the, 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 the better educated and more vocal or are nearly always coterminous with the richer sections of society. And you can see this most clearly in the United States, where to become a political candidate for the presidency, you either have to be a millionaire yourself or have the backing of millionaires. But even if one were to look at a European parliament, or take, take the European parliament, and look at the cross-section of the population who's represented in the European parliament, Look at the percentage of men and women. Look at the percentages of people from different social classes. Look at the percentages of people from different races. Does this actually represent the population of Europe? It clearly doesn't. Anybody who had a job from a polling company and selected the Euro MPs as a group to poll to get a representative sample of opinion in Europe would be fired from his job. It's clearly grossly unrepresentative. Now, well, there is a scientific way of getting a representative sample, and that's random selection. And that's actually how the Greeks did it. If you go to the museum in the Agora of Athens, you can actually see the old voting machines the ancient Greeks used. They were made out of marble, and the brass parts have long since disappeared. But they were based on the principle you put your ID card into the machine, turned a handle, or an assistant turned a handle, and if a white ball emerged, you were elected. If a black ball elected, whether you were going to be a member of the council or not. And that's the only way you can get an, a representative sample to form a, a, a deliberative body. The other system they had in ancient Greece was a town meeting, where votes would be held on major issues by a show of hands. Now, obviously, nowadays, you can't get the whole of a country together into a square to vote on something. But you can get the whole of the country to vote on who is going to be a can uh, stay in the Big Brother house or other television reality shows by using their mobile phones.
and the same technology could be readily used on important issues which have to be decided by the population as a whole. Uh, the sorts of issues which really demand that kind of democracy, I think, are issues like war or peace, whether or not um, taxes should go, go up, the major outlines of the national budget, major decisions like that should be put to the population as a whole in a referendum. Now one of the possible drawbacks, I suppose, of a democracy is that you can't predict what people are going to decide. But all that one can say is that decisions made by a large number of people tend to be better decisions than ma decisions made by one or two people. And in general, the more people who are asked their opinion about something, and the more people who decide on something, the m and if you average these decisions, the decision you get tends to be better than the decision taken by one person. So that the best hope, I think, for getting ecologically sensible decisions is firstly to raise the decision from a private decision that's made by the individual to a social decision that is made collectively. And secondly, to involve as many people collectively as possible in making that decision. Now, if a lot of people are engaged in making a decision, it raises debate and discussion about the issue. If people have a say on something, they'll take more interest in it and deliberate on their decisions. A transition to a socialist economy has to go through an intermediate stage of a transition to a cooperative-based economy. That the very first issue is an issue of democracy. The very first issue is an issue of the undemocratic nature of the current state and the need to replace it by a more democratic state. Because we don't think that you can get the really radical changes in society that, are, that we advocate unless you have a much more democratic state structure. So the first type of movement is a movement against the existing state and for direct democracy. Economically, however, we envisage the, the first stage of a transition being legislation which allows on a vote of the employees in an enterprise, for that enterprise to be transformed into one that is a worker-managed enterprise, in which a majority of the managing board are elected by or selected by lot from the workers, and a minority are appointed by the shareholders. Now, such a managing board is likely to want to pay considerably less dividends to the shareholders than the existing ones. The process of actually transforming the economy to a fully socialist economy, though, cannot be done too rapidly because you need to first put in place an alternative planning system. So you have to set up a shadow planning system first. And you would then need to have a shift from a monetary economy to a labor value economy. Now we've seen that in an, an analogous way occur in Europe where there was a shift from the national currencies to the euro after some years planning. And what occurred was that beyond a certain date the national currency ceased to be recognized as a legal means of paying debts and paying taxes. So that the, the same process would have to occur. You'd have to say that beyond a certain date all payments would have to be made in labor vouchers. Now, an effect of that is that it would be a debate on whether such a law should be passed would be enormously polarizing because those people who held large amounts of money in the old system would lose out. And those people who had large debts or even small net debts in the old system would benefit. And in a modern economy where the majority of people are debtors, I think that is potentially a very significant factor in a vote 
to abolish money and move to labour money because the majority of people would benefit from that whereas the, the millionaires who hold large amounts of money at the moment would obviously lose out, their money would become worthless. So it poses the issue of wealth and poverty in a particularly sharp fashion. Um, it poses the issue of debt and, and credit in a particularly sharp fashion. And I see that as being an important final deciding issue.